this, so I don't know what it is, but we got a lot of distortions on our little monitor here. But that's all right. We're not going to worry about that right now. As long as it's not online, uh, we're doing we're doing fine. Tonight, tonight we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 51. And if you can get your page 52, not really sure how far we'll get. Uh, in these chapters, or in this chapter, in Isaiah chapter 51 and Isaiah chapter 52, we have a group of more loosely connected dialogues or discussions about the divine deliverance, about God's very deliverance. They depict for us the breaking forth of salvation and the taking away of the divine cup of wrath from those who eagerly long for salvation. Salvation is for everyone, but it is not for everyone because not everyone is going to take advantage of it. Not everybody wants it. Not everybody is, as we look here again, for those who eagerly long for it. There are some people who, uh, through unbelief or uh, just deception, uh, they they don't take God at his word, and so therefore there's no need of salvation. But salvation really is the need of, the universal need of every man. They depict for us the breaking forth of salvation and the taking away of the divine cup of wrath from those who eagerly long for salvation. The clarion call to hearken is threefold in this, in this first chapter. And really, it, it does extend into chapter 52, as is a similar call to awaken. And one of the calls to awake we're going to see is Israel calling to God to awake, not that God is uh, uh, slumbering or asleep. Uh, they're just they're really crying out to him for deliverance. And we'll look at that and uh, as throughout the Bible study, if we get time, time to do it. The two chapters are therefore closely related, though the discourses are more loosely connected. And so tonight we're going to look at uh, beginning in chapter 51, verses 1 through 3. And what we're going to find here is the value of looking back. The value of looking back. Hearken to me, verse 1 of chapter 51. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence you are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence you are digged. Unto, look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bare you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. And he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. God at this time, in the nation's history, which was a time of distress, leads his prophet to lead his people to look back. Look back to Abraham. Look back to Sarah. He said what? I called him alone when he was just nobody, really. He was Abram, the son of Nahor, living in the land of Ur, of the Chaldees. He was just like everybody else. Why did God call Abraham? Or why did God call Abram? Well, it could be, and we don't know this, but it could be that Abram was the only one that dared to believe God. Abram was the only one that answered the call. All right, many are called, but few are chosen. Now, we, you know, we don't have evidence of that, but uh, is, it, is it God only called? What if Abram didn't answer the call? And so there, there could be some credence to that, that idea that Abram was chosen because Abram chose God. He chose to take God at his word. And from there, we, we know that Abram went out, not knowing where he went. 
all he was doing was following the voice of God, following the voice of God. And so Abram, Abram wasn't a mighty nation. He was the smallest of all people. He was puny. He was nothing. And one of the prophets, he's described as being homeless. He had no home. He had uh, no country. But it would be Abram that God would make a mighty nation out of. And so God is, is telling his prophet to tell Israel to look back. Look back to Abraham and look back to Sarah. Who was Sarah? Sarah, uh, in the eyes of the world, was a cursed woman. Why was she cursed? Because she was barren. She uh, was not able to bear any children. She had no children. And remember, the promise came to her when? When she was what? Well stricken in years. In fact, she had already gone through the time when women uh, were to have children, and she had no children, and now, technically, it was an impossibility for her to have a child. But the impossibilities of man are not the impossibilities of God, all right? The, possi the, the impossibilities of man are uh, the possibilities of God. The impossibilities of man, uh, uh, God has a little bit to say about that, all right? Let's go on. He said, look back to Abraham and unto Sarah that bear you. He called them what? The rock whence you are hewn and the hole of the pit whence you are digged. Abraham the aged and Sarah the barren, whom God blessed and multiplied. God took a nobody and made someone great out of them. And that's what God does today. Who were we when we got saved? The Bible says what? For, for, for God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, right? He said what? For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We really were the off scourge of the earth when we got saved. Many of us had a lot of problems. Because we had committed a lot of sin. We'd done a lot of sinning. And sin brings problems. God called him when he was a single individual. Not single in the sense that he was not married, but he was just one man. One man and one woman. And increased him from the one to the many. From the one to to the many. And so we see the value in looking back because in looking back, they can see what? They can see the call of God. They can see the power of God. They can see the blessings of God. They can see that they were chosen of God. And sometimes it's good for us as Christians to look back also, to look back from where we uh, came from when God found us, where we were when God found us, and where we are today. Uh, sometimes where we are today, uh, we might be uh, in a place of distress, uh, a lot of things going on, uh, like, like uh, Jacob would uh, one day say, all these things be against me. Uh, his children uh, went down into Egypt. He lost his son Joseph. And now uh, there was a possibility that he would lose uh, his old, uh, youngest son, Benjamin, and all these things. All these things were against him. And, and, uh, and yet, what he did not know was in the background, God was working everything out for his good. All right? God is able to do what? Work all things out to the good to them that love him and are the called according to his purposes. In verses 4, <clears throat> God leads his prophet to lead his people to look at the present, to look at where they are right now, to look at their immediate situation. 
Verse 4, the Bible says, Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation. For a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. My righteousness is near, my salvation is gone forth, and mine arm shall judge the people. The isles shall wait <clears throat> upon me, and mine arm shall and on my arms shall they trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Right now, look up. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. And look upon the earth beneath. Look at what's going on right here in front of you. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell thereon shall die in like manner. But... My salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. God was getting his people to look, to look <clears throat> at the, the present. What they see right now is not always going to be the way it is. What we see right now, what's going on in our world today, is not the way it is always going to be. Heaven and earth may vanish, but the Lord's triumph knows no end. God's victory is eternal. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. He tells them that the sky, the heavens, shall vanish like smoke, and the earth shall wear out like a garment. Man, how in the world does the earth wear out? The earth wears out by the inhabitants of the earth. Man, uh, people wear, they don't only wear you out, they wear the earth out. With their bad attitudes and their bad tempers and, and their, uh, you know, all the things that men put other men through and whatever. Uh, it's, not just, it's not just a trespass against us. In our uh, heart, in our uh, spirit, is a trespass against the whole earth. You know what I'm saying? The earth belongs to the Lord. And people do what they do right in the face of God with no regard to God at all. They, they thumb their nose at God. They, they abuse everything that God gave them to make their life something good and something wonderful, and they abuse it. And so the earth is going to vanish away. The sky is going to vanish away. And the dwellers on the earth shall die in swarms. He said, but my salvation shall abide forever, and my victory shall never be annulled. Man, I... I want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm walking in that victory. You know what I'm saying? I want to make sure that I am in that salvation. I want to make sure that I am part of God's glorious triumph. To miss it is to miss everything. And it's easy to miss. It's easy to miss. With such, <clears throat> with such an uplook and downlook, the outlook is very promising. Thus does Isaiah bring the immediate prospect into faith's perspective. When we look through the eye of faith, when we look through the eye of faith and we, and we see God, doesn't matter what goes on out there, doesn't matter what goes on in the sky, doesn't matter what goes on, or, you know, people are, are, are wondering, man, what about that asteroid or that, that, that big, uh, is it, are, they, are they asteroids that are up there? They're saying that it was an asteroid that, that did so much damage one time that wiped out the dinosaurs and everything else like that. It wasn't an asteroid. It was God's judgment upon a sinful, uh, cursed uh, generation. That was during the time of who? Lucifer. When Lucifer fell, he led that rebellion against God. God flipped this thing upside down in a heartbeat, man. He turned it upside down, flooded everything. The light went out. Uh, darkness was upon the face of the deep. There was no light. And so uh, ushered in the ice age. You know what I'm saying? When there's no sun, it gets cold. And water freezes when it gets cold, right? 
And so all of that was God's judgment upon the earth, his first judgment of sin. Earth's first sinless career started when? In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth. And God put inhabitants on the earth at that time. And the inhabitants of the earth at that time were who? The leader of, that, the, uh, of those inhabitants was Lucifer. All right. He was the anointed cherub. But pride entered into his heart. And he got lifted up when he saw his beauty and his might. And he said in his heart, I am going to sit where God sits. I'm going to sit on God's throne. In other words, he was going to ascend. He thought he was bigger than God. You know, and there's a lot of people that think they're bigger than God. You're not bigger than God. You may be big, but you're not that big. I like, I like that there, there's a law in teamwork. Uh, uh, you may be good, but you're not that good where you don't need anybody else. You know what I'm saying? Some of, some of these professional basketball players, man, they got such a big head. They don't think they need anybody else, but let them get out there on the court by themselves, and let's see how many games they win. You know what I'm saying? They need everybody else on the team. We need one another. We need one another. We need God. We need God, and we need one another. All right? I don't want to go to heaven by myself. I don't, you know, if there's nobody saved but me, oh, Lord, if there's nobody saved but me, what kind of heaven would God's heaven be if there's nobody saved but me? Kind of a lonely place, you know what I'm saying? That's why God, that's why God wants us to be saved. God doesn't want to be lonely. He wants us to be there with him. Let's go on. With such an uplook and downlook, the outlook is very promising. Thus, Isaiah brings the immediate Prospect into face perspective. Who are they that have hope? But they whose trust is in the Lord. You know what I'm saying? Get your eyes on this and get your eyes on that. Who is God that he shall deliver me or deliver you from me? Isn't that what Pharaoh said one time? Pharaoh found out who God was. Pharaoh found out in a very humiliating way who God really is. But let's go on. In verses 7 through 8, we see that persistence is needed. Persistence is needed. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear you not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. Here the divine message advances with the declaration, Though you know righteousness and keep the law, you are tempted to fear. That's what he's saying here. Though you know righteousness and the law, yet you're tempted to be afraid. You're tempted to fear. And the fear in which you are tempted with is the reproach of men. Do what we say or else. Remember, they told Peter and John, uh, what? Don't preach in his name no more. Don't preach in that name. And they just said, well... We ought to obey God. Ought we to obey man or obey God? We're going to obey God. The fear of man bringeth a snare. All right? <clears throat> the encouragement is to put away the fear of men. Men are human. And thus, they are subject to decay. Even the most brave and stout-hearted among us aren't going to live forever. In fact, uh, sometimes it's those men who are the bravest, the, the one enemy they fear the most is death itself. They're afraid of death. And they have a right to be afraid of death if they're not right with God. If they're not right with God, there's what? A fearful looking forward to of what? Of judgment 
and fiery indignation, which what? Shall devour the adversary. Man, if you're not right with God, the, the prospect of dying is not good. Men are human and thus are subject to decay like moth-eating garments. But God's salvation is forever. When you put your hope in him, when you put your trust in him, his salvation is forever. He is able to keep you from falling. And we are to what? Now, he can keep us from falling if we want to be kept from falling. But if we don't want to be kept, guess what? That's why he said what? Keep yourself where? In the love of God. Keep yourself in love with God. And how do you do it? You do it the same way you keep yourself in love with the woman or the man that you promise to marry all, or promise to love all the days of your life. You do it by having eyes only for that one individual. In other words, when we keep ourselves in love with God, uh, we have to turn away from the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. All right? <coughs> and so we keep ourselves in love with God by loving not the world. I don't know about you. I don't want to be like the world. I want to be what God wants me to be. And that doesn't mean that you know, I mean, there's a biblical description, a biblical description of what God wants us to be. Some people won't let you be that. Some people won't let you. It's like one, one man said after he had been pastoring for over 40 years, he went home to, uh, uh, and uh, I think it was his sister or maybe, maybe it was his grandmother. She said, I still see the devil in your eyes. I still see the devil in you. In other words, she would not let him be the man that God was making him. She was looking at what? At what he used to be, not what he was now. All right? Just keep your, you, you just keep your eyes on being what God wants you to be. And how, how do we know? Well, the, the Bible is our, is our guideline. The Bible tells us how we are supposed to be. All right? And, uh, and we're really supposed to be like Jesus. All right, let's go on. The premise here of the prophet is, is that persecution is only a passing thing compared to God's faithfulness. Persecution. Deny Christ or face the firing squad. All right, let's get this thing over. Take me down to the firing squad. Now, I, you know, that's easy to say right now. But when you're faced with it, but, I mean, how long is it going to take? You're going to die anyways, right? So you may as well make sure that when you die, you die the right way. And the right way is right where God wants you to be. You know, I wish, I, I, I wish that I can say right now, right now in my mind, in my mind, what I see is when, as soon as that bullet hits me, that takes my life, uh, takes my life, and my body falling to the ground, I see my myself falling into the hands of God. All right, falling into the not just on the earth. Now they might see me just fall to the earth, but I'm not falling just to the earth. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. He knows exactly where we are. He's there. And guess what? He's carrying us from that dead place, from that place of death into what? His life. His life into his presence. And what a blessing that is going to be. Now, the body is going to go in the grave. All right. But the spirit and the soul goes already to its long awaited home. The soul of the unjust go where? Right now, there's a temporary holding place. It's called what? It's called hell. It's called Hades. It's called Sheol. All right, but hell is going to be empty one day. 
And those that are there are going to be called up to stand before God and give account. And then from there, they're going to be cast into the lake of fire, which the Bible says is what the second death, the final death. That, and what that means, that, mean, that doesn't mean annihilation. It just means that's the last time, that's the last time that they will ever see God face to face. That's the last time that they will, uh, you know, they, they, they are alive, they're, they're alive in hell or the lake of fire. And one man said that they have all their senses there. They have all their memory there. I don't know about you. That's not the way I want to spend my eternity. You know what I'm saying? The Bible speaks about the torment of that place, what, continually ascending upward. The good news is we don't have to go there tonight because God's salvation is real and it is eternal. All right. God's faithfulness. Uh, has nothing to be compared uh, to the persecutions of this life, which are only passing. God's faithfulness is eternal. Starting in verse 9 of chapter 51 and ending in verse 6 of chapter 52, there are three calls to awake. The first call is found in verses 9 through 11, and we're going to end right here. The Bible says, awake, awake. Put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? Art thou not in which hath dried the sea, the waters of the deep, or the great deep that hath made the, the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. <coughs> Excuse my voice. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow, and mourning shall flee away. The first call to awake is a call of God's people to God to awake and put on strength. This is a fervent call for God's intervention through his conquering arm. He is called to put off or to put on strength as he did when he dealt defeat to the Egyptians, dried up the waters of the Red Sea and made a path on dry land through the Red Sea. God's people, we're, we, we are crying out for something right now. We're crying out for what? God's deliverance. We're crying out right now for God's intervention. We pray for our country. We pray for our world. We pray for our cities. We pray for our communities. We pray that God, that God would send revival. We pray that God would allow the spirit of true biblical conviction to fall on every man and every woman. Why do we pray that uh, the, the, the spirit of true conviction would fall upon every man? Not to bring them to judgment, but to bring them to the place where they see where they see their spiritual condition and they realize that they're on their way to a Christless eternity. And in seeing that, they cry out to God for salvation. That's why we pray. <clears throat> we pray that God would bring the devices of his enemies down upon their own heads. The devices, the traps that they set up for God and God's people, bring them down upon their own heads. Was that old, that old gospel song, the, the, the ditch you dig for me might be the ditch you dug for you or something like that? You better think twice or whatever, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? We pray that, and, and why do we pray so? 
we pray because we understand that the people that are hurt by these devices are our brothers and sisters. They are our young men and women. And how are they hurt? They're ensnared in a, in a uh, refuge of deceit, lies. And they're led away from God. And when you're away from God, you are like a city without walls. You have no protection. And so now you, they're subjected to every wind and, and wave of doctrine. And God wants them what? God wants them focused. He wants them to know the truth. Why? Because in knowing the truth, they are made free. Free to stand up. Free to be a, a path of resistance on the path of destruction. You know what I'm saying? Free to be a roadblock. And to be... And an undefeated uh, roadblock, you know what I'm saying, out there, leading men out of destruction. And when I mean men, I'm not talking just about men. I'm talking about the human being, man, all right, leading man to salvation. Demanding hell and manning heaven, if you understand what I'm saying. Unpopulating hell and populating heaven, that's our goal. That's our mission. God has given us the spirit of, well, I mean, I'm not the spirit, the ministry of reconciliation. He has us here for a reason. And that is to help our fellow man. And God gives us spiritual visions to help us see what's going on and to know what really is right and what really is wrong. And we come to understand that the fear of man is not right. I'm not going to be afraid of what man can do for me or to me. Because, again, it's only temporary, right, at best. Man, they can cut me up into a billion little pieces. They can cause me all kinds of pain. They can cause me all kinds of grief, but one thing they can't do, they can't destroy my soul. They can't destroy the God that's in me. They can bury me six feet in the grave, and they can say, aha, and wipe their hands and laugh. But you see, when he comes in the clouds of glory, that body they threw in the grave, no matter if it's cut in a million pieces, is coming up out of that grave, whole. There's going to be a repatriating of that body and its soul, me, the real me. Because I'm not a, a body with a soul. I am a soul with a body. It's the soul of man that is eternal. That, my friend, is what separates you from every other creature out there. The animals don't have souls. Now, they have a spirit because the spirit is what? The spirit is life. And that goes back when, a, when, 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 when an animal dies, a man, when a man dies, the spirit goes back to God. Right? When the animal dies, it goes, <laughs> it, because it's not a soul, it just goes in the ground or whatever, or it gets eaten by other animals and, and whatever, and that's, that's that. You know what I'm saying? I know you, you animal rights lovers out there and, and whatever you want your you want little Johnny, your little pet Pomeranian to go to heaven, but uh, I don't think you know you know there's a whole set of animals up there that that uh, I, I guarantee you you're gonna love when you get there. You know what I'm saying? You're gonna have your own horse. How do we know? Because we're all gonna be coming back riding on a white horse, right? So, anyways, all right, I'm done. I'm done. So. All right, God is good. And I, it's all right with me. It would be all right with me if he came back tonight. If he came back in the clouds. The longer I live down here, the easier it becomes to me to 
to say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. I'm ready. I'm ready right now. I'm ready. I'm ready. The only thing that I'm not really ready to do uh, is cause my wife to be alone in the world. You know what I'm saying? Now, she wouldn't be alone, but you know what I'm saying? And so there's some things that we want to improve on whatever so that if I was to die right now, she'd be taken care of. Now, she, she, she would have it pretty good, but not as good as it could be, all right? And we're working on that, all right? That way she wouldn't have to panic and, and whatever, and, and uh, she could just go on living, go on living, continue to be what God wants her to be. And so we fight. We fight. Because that's what this, this life really is. It's a fight. And we fight to the very end. Jesus said what? It's they that endure to the end that shall receive the crown. Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. Thank you for your goodness and mercy. Thank you for your word that is true. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but God, your word shall abide forever. Thank you for your eternal salvation, for the promise of your deliverance. God, we so look for the day when we see you face to face and we hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter ye into the rest of the Lord. But God, while we are here, while we are here doing your work, God, help us to do it with the right attitude, the right spirit. Help us to be everything you would have us to be. Accomplish your will in our lives. And we give you all the glory and the honor. And Father, right now, we pray for the fellowship tonight. Pray for all the food. We ask that you would bless it, the nourishment of our body. Thank you for all those that brought something, all the, whether they purchased it or whether they prepared it. God, thank you for them. Bless them for it. Bless our fellowship. Let it be edifying and glorifying to you, edifying to the saints and glorifying to you. In Jesus' wonderful and glorious name we ask and we pray for your glory. Amen and amen. Are there any questions tonight? When do we get to eat? Okay, right now. All right, right now. So, all right, God bless you. Bible study is over. We'll see you in the morning at 11, 11 o'clock, and there is fellowship in the